Gannon Stouch was a micro preemie born on September 29, 2008 to Albert Stouch and Landon Bullard with only a 10% chance at survival but would surpass all the odds. Albert and Landon's marriage would not last and he would remarry in 2015 to Letitia Stouch who had a daughter from a previous relationship. The couple moved from South Carolina to Colorado where Al served in the National Guard. Gannon's mother remained in South Carolina with her new husband, Mike Hyatt. At the age of 11, Gannon was a fifth grader at Grand Mountain High School and was living in Colorado Springs in the Lorson Ranch neighborhood with his father and stepmother. His father was an active duty Army National Guardsman and his stepmother was not only fired from being a teacher more than once, but was also arrested for domestic violence in both North and South Carolina in the past. In early 2020, Gannon's father, Al, was in Oklahoma for training while Gannon remained in the care of Letitia. On January 27th, she called 911 at 6.55 p.m. to say Gannon hadn't come home from his friend's house and she didn't see him when she went by to check on him and said that he may have run away. Not only could she not provide the name of Gannon's friend or parents, her story then dramatically changed multiple times over the following days. She told police that he missed school that day because he was sick, but he left home about 3 or 4 p.m. to walk to a friend's house. His father was notified and immediately flew home. Gannon's biological mother, Landon, also arrived soon after from South Carolina. Searches were done of the neighborhood, nearby fields, new subdivisions, and the Big Johnson Reservoir, where they used sonar and underwater drones to search the water. Neighboring counties were also searched. Crews used K-9 units, helicopters, and hundreds of volunteers to search for Gannon, but he was never located. The community quickly began to rally, and neighbors replaced lights throughout the complex with blue bulbs, Gannon's favorite color, and tied blue balloons and ribbons to trees to help guide Gannon home. Three days later, the El Paso County Sheriff's Office upgraded the search status from runaway to an endangered missing child due to the amount of time he was gone, his age, and medication he was taking at the time. From early on, public suspicion swirled around Gannon's stepmom after a neighbor's video surveillance surfaced that seemed to contradict what she told the police. Roderick Drayton, a neighbor of the Stouch family, provided his surveillance camera footage of Gannon on January 27. According to Drayton, his surveillance camera attached to his house had the Stouch's driveway in the frame. The video showed Gannon getting into a truck that belonged to Letitia at around 10.16 a.m. Later that day at 2.19 p.m., Letitia and Gannon returned home and this would be the last time he was ever seen alive. Interestingly, her phone would stay locked and unused from the time they got home until 2.45 p.m. This begs the question, what was she doing during this time? When he gave the video to Gannon's father, Al broke down crying and said they needed to give the video to investigators. Drayton claims that Gannon's father said she lied, he didn't go to a friend's house. However, she denied causing any harm to Gannon, and in an interview at the time, she said, I would never, ever, ever hurt this child. I took care of Gannon for the last two years in our home because his mother didn't want to do it. And I would never, never, ever hurt this child. And I know there's some questions out there about, okay, so tell me what happens. That's up to the investigations when they end up letting you guys know, but I've cooperated with them, even to the point that we were held with a gun and my daughter, a 17 year old who serves our country in the United States Air Force, who has never committed a crime or done anything wrong in her life, was put in handcuffs over the keys that was in her purse. On February 28th, Gannon's mother, Landon, asked the public to help find her missing son. I'm Landon Hyatt, Gannon's mom, and I encourage you guys, I know many of you mothers and fathers, I encourage you just to seek, find him. I'm so thankful for all the outpouring help that this case has brought. My son is a very loving kid. He wouldn't want harm on anybody at all. And it's so hard to just think, why is this happening to him? I have no clue, but my kid deserves to come home. My kid has a purpose. My kid has a life, and it's important to me, and it's important to everybody that's standing in this room. 
The sheriff's crime lab made multiple trips to the Stouch home and also removed boxes of evidence after Gannon went missing. As many as 15 detectives were working the case, reviewing surveillance footage, and re-canvassing the neighborhood for clues. Strangely, the morning after reporting him missing, she drove a rented Kia to pick up her husband at the Colorado Springs Airport after he frantically raced home to find his son. She told him that she rented the car because she was concerned about putting mileage on her Tiguan lease and said her car was parked at the elementary school. However, she only put 71 miles on the Kia, and if your stepson is missing, why would you care about miles on your car? At 7 p.m. that night, she went to the airport and picked up her Tiguan, which most likely contained the body of Gannon and then drove it to another county where she allegedly first dumped his body. Her phone was in airplane mode, and a piece of board with Gannon's blood on it was later found nearby. At some point during questioning, Letitia's story took a wild turn. She told investigators she had actually been raped at gunpoint by a man named Eduardo, who she had hired to come fix the carpet that Gannon had accidentally burned after knocking over a candle. She said Eduardo hit her on the head and then kidnapped Gannon. Then when police asked for her DNA, she faked a panic attack and went to the hospital, avoiding giving her DNA at the time. She then repeatedly reached out to police to ask if she was a suspect. She would continue to use variations of the name Eduardo, Eduardo, and even Edgar, and told a variation of the same story to Crime Online. She told them that she was covering for the real killers, hoping that the full truth would come out. She said Al owed some money to a man named Edgar, and that he took Gannon, and that Al was actually to blame. She said she was covering for Al after being threatened. However, these stories are false. Instead, she allegedly murdered Gannon after he knocked over the candle and burnt the carpet. Here is an audio clip from the house's surveillance system, and it sounds as if she has already hurt him, and you can even hear Gannon say he is bleeding. Well, devastating. Initially, Scott, I can't lie when the TMZ information was Gannon, initially... I promise this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I'm just freaked out, okay? Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? He did it. Okay, you he promise. Did not. He promised. On purpose. Pinky promise. Pinky. Okay, all right. So, listen. Listen. We're, all right, I'm, we're going to have to sell stuff to fix it, okay? Okay. So we figure out what we got to sell. We can sell the sofa. We can sell whatever. Because we got to get it fixed. So, uh, lady, don't be mad at us and kick us out of the house. Uh, okay? <coughs> you got it? Uh, the same surveillance system showed movement upstairs and a lot in the basement where his room was during the time he was most likely murdered. Blood stains were found on the concrete under his bed and on the walls and carpet. On March 2, 2020, five weeks after his disappearance, Gannon's stepmother was arrested in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina on murder charges in the presumed death of Gannon. Following the arrest of Letitia, Gannon's father wrote a statement that was read by officials on Monday. He wrote, My little boy is not coming home. We will never play Nintendo again. No more Taco Tuesdays, no more smooth-looking haircuts, and no more G-Man for the world. The person who committed this heinous, horrible crime is one that I gave more to than anyone else on this planet, and that is a burden that I will carry with me for a very long time. Investigators believe that Letitia killed Gannon in his bedroom between 2.19 p.m. and 5.34 p.m. on January 27, 2020, while the two were home alone. She claimed that Gannon had stayed home from school with an upset stomach, and she also called in sick, falsely telling her boss that her stepfather had been killed after being hit by a car. At 4.52 p.m. that afternoon, Letitia texted her daughter Harley, requesting carpet cleaner, trash bags, and baking soda at a nearby dollar store. His younger sister, Lena, had arrived home at 3.15 p.m. and was told by Letitia that Gannon was in his bed sleeping and she should go outside and play. Gannon was most likely dead at this point. Investigators would later find evidence of bloodshed in his bedroom. She tried to explain the blood was a result of Gannon cutting his foot on a tool in the garage when he was helping his dad, but this turned out to not be true. 
She faces charges of murder in the first degree of a child under 12, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with the deceased human body, and tampering with physical evidence. During Letitia's preliminary hearing, prosecutors presented evidence that she killed Gannon at their house, then initially dumped his body near Palmer Lake, Colorado, between Colorado 105 and South Perry Park Road. She then drove her vehicle back to the airport and retrieved the Kia, and then returned the Kia the next day. Her phone was turned off during this time, but police were able to use the tracking information from her car. The tracking info led them to one of the murder weapons, a board, which contained his blood. This was all before renting a van on February 1st and driving Gannon's body 1,400 miles with her teenage daughter from Colorado to Pensacola, Florida. She and her daughter stayed in a hotel in Florida, which was 3.3 miles away from the spot where Gannon's body was later discovered, and the van was seen less than two miles from the site. A few hours after checking in, the two left and drove to Orlando, then made their way to South Carolina where Letitia once lived. Investigators analyzed Letitia's online search history and found indications that she was unhappily married and did not like being a stepmother. Two weeks after her arrest, on March 18, 2020, the suitcase containing his body was finally discovered. It was estimated that he was in the suitcase for an entire month. The examination of his body, detailing his last moments, are too horrific for this video, but multiple weapons were used. The affidavit states that a week after his murder, she allegedly placed his body in a suitcase, disconnected her cell phone from the cellular network, rented a van, and drove to Florida leaving the suitcase containing that precious boy underneath a bridge. Her DNA was present on a 9mm handgun found in her house and a forensic exam determined that a bullet lodged in his head had been fired from the same gun. Two bullets were also found in a pillow that was with him in the suitcase. Letitia was charged with first-degree murder, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with a deceased human body, and tampering with physical evidence. Letitia did an interview with Nancy Grace and claimed to have passed an independent polygraph exam. Turns out, she actually bought the polygraph test from an online site called fakepolygraph.com. However, fakepolygraph.com refused to send her the results because of the questions she asked. She had called customer service to refute the denial, but fake polygraphs stuck to their decision and turned the information over to the police. Gannon's family has waited since January of 2020 for justice in his case, which was initially delayed due to the COVID pandemic. It was then further delayed when she asked to act in her own defense in February 2021. Following that decision, she changed her mind and asked a judge for new counsel. Evaluators found Letitia competent to stand trial twice. She knew the difference between right and wrong, and she knew what she did was hideously, unforgivably wrong. She's not insane and desperately tried to hide her alleged heinous crime. Her attorneys are now alleging that she may be competent for trial, but was insane and not capable of understanding what was going on at the time of the murder. Letitia shockingly entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity in February of 2022. In order to move forward with that plea, she requires a third evaluation, which is required at the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo, that is backlogged for evaluations, which only delays justice for Gannon even longer. Her trial was scheduled to begin at the end of March 2022, but her new plea caused another significant delay in the trial. If evaluators find that they believe she was sane at the time of the murder, her attorneys can bring in their own expert to create a report. At the hearing where her attorneys entered the not guilty by reason of insanity plea, they indicated that they have an out-of-state expert who has agreed to evaluate Letitia and that expert said there is a high likelihood of psychosis. Her new plea means she is claiming her mental state at the time of the killing absolves her of any criminal intent. It appears that she is playing games with the court system in Colorado. Meanwhile, she attacked an officer while in custody and tried to escape. Letitia even wrote a four-page letter to the judge complaining about life in prison and rambling about her constitutional rights, World War I, World War II, and even the American flag. She said she has a doctorate in education, which is not true. She was actually fired days before the murder for lying on her application. 
She was even fired from her job in South Carolina before relocating to Colorado. Letitia's preliminary hearing in September of 2021 revealed that Gannon went through significant trauma before he died. Her next court appearance is scheduled for June 9, 2022, and Gannon's loved ones are beyond ready for justice. His mother says she will miss his corny jokes that he loved to tell her, and his younger sister misses her bubba. In the words of Reddit user Munted Void, now that Sonic 2 is coming out, every time I see a trailer for it, I'm inclined to think about Ganon, who was so excited to see the first Sonic movie. But of course, because of one inhuman monstrous woman, he never got to see it. In a way, the Sonic movie represents all that Ganon will miss out on after fighting so hard for his life as an infant. He'll never experience high school, never experience college, never get to dance with his mom at his wedding, never get to go to sports games or movies with his dad again, never get to see his baby sister Lena get married. One woman who should have loved him fiercely took that all away from him and his family. Now he's forever 11 years old. The topic of an afterlife is divisive, but you can only hope there is one. So Gannon can one day see his parents, sister, friends, and family again. When Kyle Ramirez was a child, he lived in Tracy, California, along with his sibling, and was known as the kid who came to school without lunches, had missing patches of hair on his head, and always looked malnourished. This wouldn't go unnoticed, and reports were filed with CPS, but they never followed up on the abuse and neglect. Turns out, Kyle was being tortured at home and would have to endure his pain for at least seven horrible years. In 2000, when Kyle was eight, he was left by his biological mother in the care of a family friend named Karen Ramirez. There were never any court proceedings to officially assign Kyle to Ramirez, only a handwritten note from Kyle's mother, which a CPS worker agreed with, and a required legal investigation was never done. Ramirez never had legal guardianship, and CPS failed to look for other family members or even contact Kyle's biological mother when the abuse reports started. In 2005, Kyle's sibling was placed into protective custody because of the abuse from Ramirez. That's when the sibling told CPS about the abuse Kyle was suffering from. However, it would not be until 2007 before Ramirez was arrested and Kyle was removed from the home and placed into protective custody. Shockingly, Ramirez was allowed to still communicate with Kyle and convinced him to leave protective custody and run away from his foster home. He was reported missing from placement on May 9, 2007, but once again, CPS failed and there was no further investigation. At this point, he was held captive in a home on Tennis Lane in Sacramento, California, with Ramirez, a married couple Michael Schumacher and Kelly Lau, and several other young children for over 18 months. The three adults, along with their neighbor Anthony Waiters, were described as sadistic, demented monsters who tortured and abused Kyle every single day for the next 18 months. That is until December 1st, 2008, when 17-year-old Kyle made a decision that would change his life forever. While chained to the fireplace, he overheard Schumacher and Waiters saying they were going to chop him up and throw him in the Delta. That's when he was able to unlock himself with a key he had gotten from the Schumacher's two-year-old son and had kept hidden. Kyle said he knew it was time to escape because he had been caught unchained, looking for food earlier in the day, and Ramirez had threatened him and cut his back with a meat cleaver that belonged to waiters. He said he kept watch on Schumacher's wife, Kelly Lau, through a mirror and escaped by running through a backyard while Lau was yelling for him to come back. He quickly jumped on a trampoline, hopping a retaining wall, and ran into the nearby in-shaped sports club. A video shows the frightened, shackled teen, covered in soot and bruises, entering the club hunched and clutching the chain wearing only boxers. He was shaking and begged for the employees to hide him, repeating over and over, they're coming for me. The stunned employees attempted to comfort and calm him and called 911. He said he knew it was now or never because he thought Schumacher and waiters were going to kill him. He said, I thought I was probably going to die that night. 
He was treated at the hospital for open wounds and had deep scars and cuts all over, with the worst cut being a long cut to his back. He would later tell police that he was beaten, burned, denied food, cut, chained to a table, and forced to sleep chained to a coffee table and fireplace. He also told them he was 16 years old as he had not realized he had actually turned 17 on September 15, 2008, a couple months earlier. The married couple's home where he was held captive also housed their four children who were put in the custody of social services. On her MySpace page, Lau said her four children were ages one to nine. She described herself as a stay-at-home mother, a Daisy Girl Scouts leader, and die-hard Oakland Raiders fan who is happily married to a man who I love to death. Their neighbors reported that they sometimes saw Kyle doing chores outside and due to his appearance, were shocked to learn that he was older than 13. Although Kyle could have escaped earlier, he was extremely frightened to do so until he heard that he would be murdered that night. During his testimony, Kyle, now a healthy 6'2", 18-year-old weighing 250 pounds, instead of a tattered, emaciated, and bloody 5'8 boy weighing 100 pounds, said the four adults referred to him as a problem child. He said the beating started because Ramirez, his former caretaker, blamed him for her debts. During trial for his torture, Waiter's attorney, Alan Jose, brought up the fact that Kyle is a black belt in Taekwondo, which he acknowledged, but said he still didn't fight back. Prosecutor Angela Hayes asked him why he didn't use his skills to fight off his abusers, which he explained that there were too many of them and they outweighed him. Jose tried to poke holes in his story, reminding him that he told police that when waiters hit him with a bat, that he hit him full force. Jose asked if he went to the hospital, and Kyle said no, adding that no one would have taken him. He said he was often hit with an aluminum bat. They would just hit me, my back, my head, basically everywhere. He said wounds to his head were treated with wax and superglue. When he and Karen Ramirez first moved into the Tennis Lane home, he said he was told to do household chores, and the demands, abuse, and poor living conditions escalated and was ultimately forced to sleep chained to a fireplace. He said that around Halloween 2008, he was struck and burned with a metal bat that his abusers heated up until it was red hot. Toward the end of his testimony, Kyle showed jurors the scars on his arms that he received during his time in captivity. They were also shown photos of burns to his abdomen. Three of the four suspects accepted plea deals. In San Juan King County Superior Court, 45-year-old Karen Ramirez accepted a plea deal that gave her 34 years in prison. 32-year-old Kelly Lau received 33 years, and her husband, 36-year-old Michael Schumacher, accepted a deal that gave him 30 years. The neighbor, 31-year-old Anthony Waiters, faced the same charges but was not part of the deal and went to trial. Waiters used his fist, lighter fluid, and a knife to participate in the abuse. Waiters was charged with torture, false imprisonment, and child cruelty. Kyle told the court that on one occasion, Waiters hit him with an aluminum bat, then cut him, while Ramirez and Lau held him down. He said, apparently that was not enough, so he cut my arm, adding that Waiters was grinding the knife back and forth. It hurt. Anthony Waiters was convicted of torture, aggravated mayhem, felony child abuse, and false imprisonment, among other counts, and sentenced to three concurrent life terms in prison. While at the home, his captors struck him with belts, a hammer, and a baseball bat, and his wounds were treated with a mix of bleach, butter, and salt. He was forced to urinate and defecate on himself while chained to the fireplace. He described being beaten and knocked out by waiters in boxing gloves one day when Lau and Karen Ramirez made up a story about him misbehaving. Kyle sued the county's Child Protective Services and its social workers for negligence and protocol violations in the years leading up to Kyle's imprisonment. According to the complaint, CPS did not report Kyle's absence from protective custody, and he was ultimately awarded $4 million. In 2015, Kyle was enrolled in college and playing football. In a statement released through his attorney, Kyle said of his captors, I wish them the best with where they are at in life, and said that he hopes they find their peace. 
and in the words of Web Sleuth member Cindy D, hopefully they will get a regular reminder from other inmates that they are the scum of the universe, the lowest of the low, the sort of human trash that everyone despises, and if I had my way, I would throw them all in a big hole in the middle of nowhere and leave them to rot, rant over. Well said, Cindy D. Well said. Stephen Gregory Stainer was born in 1965 to Delbert and Kay Stainer. The family lived in Merced, California, and Stephen was one of five children. On the afternoon of December 4, 1972, at the age of seven, Stephen was approached on his way home from school by a man named Irvin Edward Murphy, who was described as naive and simple-minded. He had become acquainted with convicted child rapist Kenneth Parnell as they both worked at a resort in Yosemite National Park. Murphy had been enlisted by Parnell into helping him abduct a young boy so that Parnell could raise him in a religious type deal. Parnell easily convinced Murphy to hand out gospel tracts to boys walking home from school that day and after spotting Stephen, Murphy claimed to be a church representative seeking donations. Murphy asked him if his mother would be willing to donate any items to the church. When the boy replied that she would, Murphy then asked Stephen where he lived and if he would be willing to take Murphy to his home. After Stephen agreed, Parnell pulled up in a car and Stephen hopped in. But instead of taking him home, Parnell then drove a confused Stephen to his cabin in nearby Kathy's Valley instead, which unbeknownst to Stephen, was located only a few hundred feet from his grandfather's home. Parnell molested Stephen the first night at the cabin and then began raping him 13 days later on December 17, 1972. After Stephen told Parnell many times during that first week that he wanted to go home, Parnell told Stephen that he had been granted legal custody because his parents could not afford so many children and that they did not want him anymore. Parnell began calling the boy Dennis Gregory Parnell and began enrolling him in various schools over the next several years. Parnell passed himself off as Stephen's father, and the two moved frequently around California, living in locations including Santa Rosa and Comche. He allowed Stephen to begin drinking at a young age and to come and go virtually as he pleased. Parnell had also moved from one menial job to another, some of his work requiring travel, and leaving Stephen unguarded, causing an adult Stephen to remark he could have easily used these absences as opportunities to flee, but was unaware how to summon help. For a period of 18 months, a horrible woman named Barbara Matthias lived with Parnell and Stephen. According to Stephen, Matthias, along with Parnell, raped him on many occasions at the age of nine. In 1975, on Parnell's instructions, Matthias tried to lure another young boy who was in the Santa Rosa Boys Club with Stephen into Parnell's car, but the attempt was unsuccessful. As Stephen entered puberty, Parnell began to look for a younger child to kidnap. Parnell had used Stephen to attempt to kidnap children on prior occasions, but all the kidnapping attempts were unsuccessful. This caused Parnell to believe Stephen lacked the means to be an accomplice. Stephen revealed later that he had intentionally sabotaged these failed kidnappings. On February 14, 1980, Parnell and a teenage friend of Stephen's named Randall Sean Poorman kidnapped five-year-old Timmy White in Ukiah. Poorman noticed five-year-old Timmy playing outside his parents' house in Ukiah, California and ushered him into Parnell's getaway car. When Timmy refused and attempted to run indoors, Poorman shoved the boy against a chain-link fence, forced him to loosen his grip, then dragged him kicking and screaming into the car. Parnell made quick work in brainwashing Timmy as he had done with Stephen, repeatedly trying to get him to think his new name was Tommy. Parnell paid off Poorman with cash and marijuana, then ordered him to leave and never speak of the incident. Parnell also dyed Timmy's blonde hair dark brown in order to mask his appearance from the forthcoming missing child posters. Ultimately, Parnell would pass him off as his younger son and Stephen's brother. Timmy bonded with Stephen during the 16 days he was held captive and spoke favorably of how the older boy took care of him. Stephen did not want Timmy to endure the sexual abuse that he endured and made a plan to return him home. On March 1, 1980, while Parnell was away at his night security job, 14-year-old Stephen left carrying little Timmy on his back and hitchhiked into Ukiah. 
After they were unable to find Timmy's home and being unfamiliar with the city, Stephen decided to go to a police station. By daybreak the next morning, Parnell had been arrested on suspicion of abducting both boys. When the police checked into his background, they found a previous sodomy conviction from 1951, although at the time, Stephen insisted that Parnell had not sexually abused him. Both children were reunited with their families that day. The first paragraph of Stephen's written police statement given during the early hours of March 2, 1980 in Ukiah reads, My name is Stephen Stainer, which he misspells his last name. I am 14 years of age. I don't know my true birth date, but I use April 18, 1965. I know my first name is Stephen. I'm pretty sure my last is Stainer, and if I have a middle name, I don't know it. In 1981, Parnell was tried and convicted of kidnapping Timmy and Stephen in two separate trials. He was sentenced to only seven years, which is a total joke, and paroled after serving five. Parnell was not charged with numerous sexual assaults on Stephen and other boys because most of them occurred outside the jurisdiction of the Merced County prosecutor or were by then outside the statute of limitations. The Mendocino County prosecutors decided not to prosecute Parnell for the sexual assaults that occurred in their jurisdiction. Murphy, for helping kidnap Stephen, and Poor Man, for helping kidnap Timmy, were convicted of lesser charges. Both claimed they knew nothing of the sexual assaults on Stephen. Matthias was never arrested. Stephen remembered the kindness Uncle Murphy had shown him in his first week of captivity while they were both under the influence of Parnell's manipulation, and he believed that Murphy was as much Parnell's victim as he and Timmy were. Stephen's kidnapping and its aftermath prompted California lawmakers to change state laws to allow consecutive prison terms in similar abduction cases. After returning to his family, Stephen had trouble adjusting to a more structured household as he had been allowed to smoke, drink, and do as he pleased when he lived with Parnell. In an interview with Newsweek shortly after his escape, Stephen said, I returned almost a grown man, and yet my parents saw me at first as their seven-year-old. After they stopped trying to teach me the fundamentals all over again, it got better. But why doesn't my dad hug me anymore? Everything has changed. Sometimes I blame myself. I don't know sometimes if I should have come home. Would I have been better off if I didn't? Stephen underwent brief counseling, but never sought additional treatment. He also refused to disclose all the details of sexual abuse he endured from Parnell. In a 2007 interview, Stephen's sister said that her brother did not seek counseling because their father said Stephen didn't need any. But his father likely didn't want it to come to light that he had been molesting his two daughters. Stephen was bullied by other children at school for being molested and eventually dropped out. He began drinking often and the relationship with his father was strained and he was eventually kicked out. In 1985, Stephen married 17-year-old Jody Edmondson and the couple had two children. He also worked with child abduction groups, spoke to children about personal safety, and gave interviews about his kidnapping. On September 16, 1989, 24-year-old Stephen left work at the local pizza shop driving his motorcycle when he was hit by a car which caused fatal head injuries. The driver fled the scene but was later identified by witnesses and only served three months in jail. Several hundred people attended his funeral, at which 14-year-old Timmy White was a pallbearer. In early 1989, a television miniseries based on his experience, I Know My First Name is Stephen, was produced. Stephen, taking a leave of absence from his job, acted as an advisor for the production and had a non-speaking part, playing one of the two policemen who escort 14-year-old Stephen through the crowds to his awaiting family. Although pleased with the dramatization, Stephen did complain that it depicted him as a somewhat obnoxious, rude person, especially toward his parents, something he refuted while publicizing the miniseries in the spring of 1989. In the year 2000, Stephen's older brother, 37-year-old Carrie Stainer, was arraigned on murder charges. He murdered two women and two teenage girls near Yosemite National Park in 1999. 42-year-old Carol Sund, her daughter, 15-year-old Julie Sund, 
Julie's friend, 16-year-old Argentine exchange student Sylvina Peloso, and Yosemite Institute employee Joy Ruth Armstrong, a 26-year-old naturalist. Strangely, in the interview room after admitting to his crimes, he said he would cooperate if the detective could provide him pictures or videos of little girls, if maybe they had some sort in evidence that he could fetch. He put another term on the confession by demanding that his family get the $250,000 reward being offered and wanted to be housed in a federal prison being built near his hometown of Merced. After his arrest, he said he had fantasized about murdering women since he was seven years old, long before the abduction of his brother. He said his uncle began molesting him about six months after Stephen was abducted. The Stainer family tree was riven with mental illness and sexual abuse going back five generations. According to the psychiatrist's report, Stainer's father, Delbert Stainer, was ordered into therapy for molesting his own daughters. In addition to her father's unwanted advances, one of Stainer's sisters said that Carrie started peeping on her and inappropriately touching her when she was 10. A cousin said that Stainer spied on her and his sisters and a neighbor girl hiding under their beds and secretly videotaping them in the bathroom and bedroom. One relative described child sexual abuse as like a family sickness because it had been going on for so many generations. In 2004, 72-year-old Parnell was convicted of trying the previous year to persuade his caretaker's sister to procure for him a young boy for $500. Aware of Parnell's past, she reported this to local police. Timmy, then a grown man, was subpoenaed to testify in Parnell's criminal trial. Although Stephen was dead, his testimony at Parnell's earlier trial was read to jurors as evidence in Parnell's 2004 trial. Parnell died in 2008 while serving a sentence of 25 years to life. Timmy later became a Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputy. He died on April 1, 2010, at the age of 35 from pulmonary embolism. Nearly five months later, on August 28, 2010, a statue of Stephen and Timmy was dedicated in Applegate Park in Merced. <laughs>